Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, first of all, I want another round of applause for those great startups. Uh, you guys were wonderful. Um, and you really, uh, you give an old entrepreneur like me real hope for, for the future. Uh, also, to our host, Larry Lisser and Embrace, thank you very much. It is my honor to be sitting up here um, with a man who everybody knows uh, a little about, but I don't think anybody really knows a lot about uh, at least the kinds of things that you need to know. So I want to introduce everybody to John Scully. Uh, and John, uh, the, the uh, interview we're going to talk about in, in sort of three stages. First, I want to talk about the beginning of your career um, and some of the incredible things you did while at Pepsi. Then we'll talk about that, um, that fruit company you worked for, for a little while. And then I want to talk about the, the incredible things you're doing today. So I'd like to uh, first begin with, you started at Pepsi, you were what, five, six? Um, I joined uh, Pepsi. I was the first MBA that Pepsi had ever hired. Uh, this was back in 1967. And um, I was, I guess, uh, 26 years old or something like that. And uh, they didn't know what to do with me, so they put me out on a route truck for six months. And I drove uh, Pepsi routes uh, in different markets, started in Pittsburgh, went out to uh, Phoenix, Arizona in the middle of the summer, up to usually 122 degrees in the sun. And then I was in Las Vegas for a while, and then I was in, ended up uh, in Milwaukee. Well, so for six months you're driving a truck, and three and a half years later, you become the youngest vice president at Pepsi. I'm I, sure that was just an easy day in the park. Well, it was it's kind of interesting because uh, Pepsi was going through a major change. Um, there, there were no such things as uh, brand managers back in the 1960s. And the soft drink industry had largely grown up uh, with people with high school educations who had uh, come up through the bottling system. And suddenly the uh, realization that uh, big brand marketing was something that was upon us back in the 1960s. So uh, I had uh, uh, worked at an advertising agency before that on the Coca-Cola account. And so I knew a little bit about um, soft drinks and, and brand marketing. Um, I had a, a market research background as well. Uh, I'd done um, um, mathematical modeling and things of that sort when I was in, in uh, university. Um, and so I was uh, thrust into the uh, research department. And in the research department, I ended up, uh, uh, it was a very small research department, uh, eventually being uh, put in charge of it. And that was my first real management job at, at Pepsi. Well, and it's interesting because beyond just managing the blocking and tackling of research, you learned a lot about marketing during that time, didn't you? Uh, I did because I used to read anything I could find. And, and uh, what happened was that uh, cyclamates were, uh, which is the artificial sweetener used in diet soft drinks, were banned uh, in 1969. And at that time, the uh, uh, president of Coca-Cola was out of the country. The president of uh, Pepsi was out of the country. And so I was designated to be the spokesperson for Pepsi, ended up being the spokesperson for the industry, and went on the Walter Cronkite news show and had to explain uh, what was the reason behind uh, the, the ban of cyclamates and what was Pepsi going to do about it. And suddenly people said, who is this kid? Um, to, obviously no one had ever heard of me before. And that kind of gave me my lucky break um, to get noticed at exactly the time when McKinsey had been brought in to uh, help reorganize Pepsi and to update its uh, uh, management approaches. And so I was assigned to the McKinsey team to work on the restructuring. And as a result of that, they recommended to the management of, of uh, Pepsi that I actually be um, appointed the first marketing VP that Pepsi had. Well, and, and inside of that time, as you were building your, your legend in marketing, um, you really became the uh, biggest advocate of, relation, of, of creating a relationship between the person and the brand, which has now become known as experience marketing. Could you explain, A, what experience marketing was? And I mean, look, you were staring Coke in the eye. They were twice your size. They were huge. They, so how did you take this new marketing concept? What was it? And how did you then use it to kick Coke's 
Uh, well, I had attended a, a presentation that Margaret Mead, uh, the, the uh, great anthropologist, was giving at the Museum of Modern Art uh, back in 1969. And she said, the most important fact for marketers is going to be, and I, my ears perked up on that, uh, is going to be the uh, emergence of an affluent, middle-class, uh, young consumer, uh, which is the first consumer ever to have discretionary money to spend, and she called them the baby boomers. Uh, these are the same baby boomers who are now retiring. They were um, in their teens, early 20s. And this was really intriguing uh, because as, we, as I eventually got uh, appointed marketing VP of Pepsi, uh, we started to think about how are we going to be able to stand up uh, versus Coca-Cola, who at that time was outspending us about five to one. Uh, they were much, much larger than Pepsi. And so we said, um, why not uh, focus on these baby boomers? And our advertising agency and our uh, team, you know, we all came up with uh, something that was called the Pepsi Generation. And uh, that was the first lifestyle campaign. The whole idea behind it, uh, uh, don't sell the product, uh, sell the experience. And the experience was the lifestyle experience. We treated Pepsi like a fashion. You know, we wanted people to be proud to be identified you know, holding a Pepsi. So we made commercials that never actually um, talked about the product. Coke was talking about their product, the real thing. What we did was our agency went out to Hollywood and said, we want the best uh, motion picture directors to create for Pepsi uh, 60 second movies about lifestyle and experience. Now, at this very same time, as I said, most of uh, these stories are about good luck being in the right place at the right time. Uh, well, it happened at, at that particular time, um, small black and white TVs were transitioning out and larger color TVs were transitioning in. So the idea that you could actually show high quality uh, video uh, which showed lifestyle was pretty unique at that point in time. We would obviously not think so anymore, but in those days that was pretty unique and that was the beginning of lifestyle marketing and the Pepsi generation. We called it, we named it experience marketing. So, so what you were really doing is, is in addition to creating this, your, this relationship with a brand, there really wasn't anybody doing that kind of brand relationship experience marketing at that time, was there? Not uh, to the extent that Pepsi did. Uh, a few years later, we came out with another campaign uh, called the Pepsi Challenge. We actually uh, went to markets where we were way outsold by Coca-Cola, um, typically uh, eight or nine times to one. Uh, we started this campaign down in San Antonio, Texas. And that particular uh, area of the country, um, most of the people we were trying to market to uh, thought that you know, Coke was the only soft drink, and the idea of even uh, trying Pepsi was just an absurd idea to people. Well, why would I ever want to do that if, you're, if I'm in San Antonio, Texas? So um, the campaign we ran called Pepsi Challenge, uh, because we could go out and visit uh, stores directly, we had a store door delivery system, we were able to use our bottlers to go out and set up uh, challenge booths. The challenge booths were where people could take blind taste tests. We'd actually, back when I was running uh, research at Pepsi, had done taste tests. And we found that under perfect conditions, uh, if you didn't tell people the name of the, of the product, if you gave it to them as a blind taste test, um, that Pepsi was actually slightly preferred versus Coca-Cola. Not by much, but it was like 56 uh, you know, 54, uh, 46. And, uh, but as soon as you put the brand on, Coke always won. So we said, well, let's run a taste test where we don't tell people what it is. And if we can get people to come up and try it, all we were interested in were getting the expression of the experience of that Coca-Cola drinker when they discovered that they had selected Pepsi over Coke. And that's the only thing we, we, we put on video, and that became the Pepsi Challenge campaign, and it drove Coke crazy. Well, those are great commercials, and I remember you know, the, the sheer shock, and in some case horror, of people when they realized that they were picking Pepsi, because as you said, it wasn't in their DNA. So now your, your, your legend has grown. You've become, you became the youngest CEO of Pepsi. Yes. And how old were you when you became CEO of Pepsi? Um, I never, I don't remember the exact age, but I guess I was um, in, in my mid-30s. Yeah. So you're in your mid-30s, you're now the CEO of Pepsi, and you get a call one day from somebody from a computer company. 
And, and, and how does that first, first conversation happen between you and Steve Jobs? Well, I had been actually recruited by uh, an executive search firm called Hydric and Struggles. Um, I was not the first choice for Apple to talk to. Uh, I didn't come out of the computer industry. Uh, the deal that the Apple board had made with Steve, apparently, was that uh, Steve at that time was about 26 years old. And the deal they made was that Steve really wanted to be the CEO. And the board didn't think he was ready for it. Uh, so while they wouldn't pick him, they gave him veto rights over whom they did pick. And apparently they went through every logical name in high tech and Steve didn't uh, approve. So uh, David Rockefeller, who was one of the early investors in Apple, said, well, why don't you try a different part of the country in a different industry? And so Jerry Roach, who was um, the most uh, famous executive recruiter at that time, said, well, uh, let's try Scully. I know he's you know, comfortable with technology, even though um, he, he doesn't know anything about computers. So he was the one who set up the first meeting between Steve and I, and that took place um, out at Apple's offices, which in those days were, you know, very simple tilt-up um, buildings in Silicon Valley, and um, Steve was uh, in an office, and that's, that's where we met. That was, that was back in uh, 1982. But as I recall, it wasn't an easy recruitment even for, for the great Steve Jobs to convince you to come over from such a great position at Pepsi. Well, at that time, no one uh, had ever gone from corporate America to Silicon Valley. It just had never happened. Uh, and no one had ever moved into um, a CEO position into a high-tech company who didn't grow up as an engineer. Um, so uh, it didn't... You know, it wasn't a natural fit. <laughs> it, well, you, you, were, you, you were by far very different. As you pointed out, corporate America and Silicon Valley were very, were very different. But ultimately, you had a conversation with Steve in which you did agree. And, and can you share that conversation? Well, Steve and I actually spent about five months getting to know each other. And, and he would come back to the East Coast, and I would go out to California. We'd just hang out. And, and anyone who's read about Steve knows that uh, one of his favorite ways of uh, dealing with uh, anything is to walk around, and we take long walks uh, around the Stanford campus and up into the, the uh, hills of, uh, in the um, Silicon Valley area. But uh, eventually we were back in New York, and Steve had just bought a new apartment uh, at the San Remo Towers on Central Park West. Uh, it was now um, in March of 1983, and we were standing up on the terrace of this triplex that Steve had bought, and I said, Steve, I really thought about it. And um, I said, I would love to be your friend. I'd love to help you, just be your advisor for free. But um, I'm not leaving Pepsi. I'm staying here. And there was this long pause. And Steve looks down at his running shoes. Uh, he had uh, blue jeans, mock turtleneck, black sweater, uh, a outfit you might recognize. And uh, except he was you know, in his mid-20s, and he looks up at me, this thick black hair, uh, eyes that were you know, as, as uh, uh, dark as you can imagine, and um, he stares right at me just a few inches away, and he said, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life, or do you want to come with me and change the world? And as we all know, Steve Jobs is the most char charismatic, best salesman in the world. So um, he didn't close the sale then, but um, a week later, I was working for Apple. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a great story. And, and what happens next is, is incredible. So first of all, I want you to talk about what was going on in the computer industry at that time. You're joining, you're joining uh, Apple. Uh, Apple wasn't the premier provider of computing uh, hardware and software at that time. So what was the landscape? The, the landscape like? Well, the landscape was uh, <clears throat> a company called Atari outsold Apple two to one. Another company called Commodore outsold Apple two to one. Um, Apple had introduced the Apple three the year before I came and it had failed. Uh, the uh, IBM PC had been introduced 18 months earlier and it was just uh, catching up and, and getting ready to pass Apple. Um, Apple was just getting ready to launch Lisa. Uh, in fact, it had just launched Lisa. And 
Uh, Lisa was way, way overpriced for the market, uh, about $10,000. Um, cost of $5,000 for uh, five megabytes of hard drive. You can imagine that. That's megabytes, not gigabytes of hard drive. Um, so Lisa was you know, not going to succeed. Um, and there was a problem. Um, Steve was creating a product called Macintosh. Uh, it was still at least um, you know, more than a year away from being finished. Uh, the company needed cash to fund that development. And the only cash flow of the company was coming from the Apple II, which at that point was an aging product, uh, going on you know, a little over five years old. Um, so my job, knowing nothing about computers, was to uh, keep the cash flow coming from the Apple II long enough that Steve had the cash to build the Macintosh and we had the runway to be able to have the cash to introduce Mac you know, with advertising. What fascinated Steve about me was clearly not anything to do with technology, um, but it was he was fascinated with uh, this thing called experience marketing. And he said, look, I'm building a computer that's going to change the world, and it's all about user experience. And he said, I really get experience marketing. You know, we've got to do that at Apple. I mean, uh, what you and Pepsi, what Pepsi and Coke did in the Cola Wars in the 70s is what we have to do with IBM you know, in the 1980s with the computer wars. And he said, we're going to win with Macintosh because it's going to be insanely great. Uh, so that's why I was brought to Apple. So, and I think a lot of people misunderstand this. So your, your vision in the marketing side, um, together with Steve's vision on the product side, was a pretty impressive juggernaut for those next few years. Well, Steve Jobs is an incredibly fast learner. And uh, so he really got uh, what experience marketing was, was about. But keep in mind that uh, back in the 1980s, uh, there was almost no marketing, uh, certainly no big brand consumer marketing going on in high tech. I mean, IBM wasn't doing it. Hewlett Packard wasn't doing it. I mean, you know, the big companies in those days. So uh, people in Silicon Valley thought Apple had totally lost it when they saw that they hired a guy who knew nothing about computers to come in and do this thing called experience marketing for a product that wasn't even finished yet. Uh, so there's a lot of skepticism in Silicon Valley. There was a lot of skepticism inside of Apple, particularly with the engineers, as to you know, what was this all about. Well, the reason why uh, Steve, I, and the board all thought it could work was that um, Steve and I were always meant to be a team. You know, we were never meant to be you know, uh, uh, untethered from each other. Well, you had an ability to tell the world about his technological dream. And isn't that really what he wanted and what you wanted? Well, we actually weren't even telling them about technology. I mean, uh, if you uh, recall the introductory commercial we did uh, at the Super Bowl for the Mac, uh, it was interesting. Last week I was uh, in New York City at the um, uh, Advertising uh, Creative Hall of Fame where they were inducting um, a great friend of mine, Steve Hayden, who was the person who actually created the 1984 Super Bowl commercial. So we were reminiscing about that. And uh, Steve Hayden, Lee Cloud, who was uh, the um, creative head of, of the um, agency Shia Day that we were working with, and Steve and myself and a few others were sitting around in October of 1983, and we were... Uh, getting ready to develop the launch campaign for the Macintosh, which was going to happen uh, in 1984. And just uh, the day earlier, the cover story of Business Week magazine came out, and it said, the winner is IBM. And they had just introduced a product that had been known under the code name Peanut, but it had been introduced as the PC Junior. And every pundit in the industry said, it's over for Apple. This is the final nail in the coffin. Uh, the IBM is going to dominate, the PC Junior is going to be at a price point you know, that will be you know, below, lower than the Apple II and there's no way Apple can survive. So Steve was beside himself and so we were all sitting around and said, well, what can we do? Uh, and the answer was, 
well, why don't we pick something that's going to be big in 1984 and kind of ride the wave of that? And the obvious uh, idea that came up was George Orwell, 1984. Um, and as we were sitting there, he said, yeah, but everybody's going to do George Orwell type ads. Sure. Uh, and then I think we said, well, not in January. Uh, if we can just do something that preempts everybody uh, so they won't even want to try. Uh, I remember Steve uh, leaned over to um, Steve Hayden and Lee Clow, and he said, uh, he said, I want something that will stop the world. And that was the final message as they went out. A week later, they came back with storyboards, and it was uh, the commercial, which we all know, that ran at the Super Bowl. It was amazing. It was an amazing mm -hmm. commercial, and it really launched a whole new era at Apple. But let's now fast forward, because it, the, even on the uh, folks who went to ask Scully, uh, on Twitter, um, one of the questions was, well, all the t talk was that, that John Scully fired Steve Jobs. Well, that's just not true, is it? Um, can you tell, one of my favorite John Scully stories is, is really sort of the beginning of the end, which was that, th that, that discussion between you and Steve uh, regarding the Apple II. Uh, well, uh, some, sometimes, you know, uh, myth becomes reality if you say it enough times. Um, and uh, so uh, I think it was finally cleared up when Walter Isaacson wrote, wrote his book uh, that what really happened was that the, um, in 1985, uh, Steve had introduced the Macintosh office. Um, and the Macintosh office was the first time that a laser printer had been connected to a Macintosh. And this was called WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. The problem was Moore's Law. Uh, microprocessors just weren't fast enough in 1985 to be able to run a laser printer and be able to run graphics on a screen and be able to synchronize it uh, to be able to do the really high resolution, what we eventually uh, later called desktop publishing. Um, so Steve uh, was pretty depressed as the sales just didn't go anywhere. And it was, it was uh, um, not a happy story for um, Macintosh. And Mac was being called a toy. It was being uh, taunted by uh, people in the industry. They said it's never going to succeed. And, and, and this was like Steve's baby. So uh, he, had, uh, he and I had had a disagreement uh, uh, during the launch of the Mac that in order to get enough money to support it, uh, that I said it needed to be priced at $24.95. And Steve said he wanted it priced at $19.95. And I said, Steve, we just don't have the money to do that because um, we're a public corporation, and all the profits coming from the Apple II. Well, now in 1985, when the Mac wasn't selling with the Macintosh office, Steve said, I want to lower the price of the Mac office, and I want to shift the money from the Apple II um, to be able to put more weight behind the Macintosh office. And I said, Steve, that's the wrong thing to do. The Apple II is still generating all the cash. Uh, and we don't have a, have a price problem with the Macintosh office. It just doesn't do what we want it to be able to do. Um, and he said, well, I disagree with you. And I said, well, we're a public corporation. You know, this is too big a decision. We've got to discuss it with the board. And he said, I don't believe you'll go to the board. And I said, watch me. You know, and so he and I both went to the board. Um, we both presented our case to the board. Um, the board um, then asked us both to step out. They met privately. Then they came back, uh, asked us to come back, and they asked Mike Markula, who was the third founder of Apple, uh, who was vice chairman, to go out and do an, an investigative uh, study, uh, talk to executives, engineers, various people at Apple, and come back and make a recommendation to the board, uh, whether to go with Steve or whether to go with John. You know, a week later, Mike did that, reported to the board, said, uh, the board decided uh, we agree with John's strategy, and they asked Steve to step down. Uh, not from the company. He was still chairman, still the largest shareholder, uh, but they asked him to step down from running the Macintosh division. Now, that's what happened, um, but as I look back at, at it in hindsight, uh, it was the wrong decision. Um, I mean, I strongly believe now, with 30 years of experience in high tech, that really innovative companies like Apple, uh, or, you know, Facebook or Google, uh, these companies need to be run by product leaders. 
uh, that even if you have you know, uh, the opportunity to, to do innovative marketing, that it's the product leadership that determines the success of these, these businesses. So my sense is that the board made the, made the wrong decision in asking Steve to step down. Um, we should have tried to spend more time figuring out how to get Steve and I to work together and uh, you know, not do the decision he wanted, but, th but to, to lose Steve, um, obviously in, in hindsight, you know, didn't make a lot of sense. You know, it's funny you say that, but I'm not sure, uh, and, and you and I talked about this earlier, I'm not sure if I agree, because you for the next seven years were able to create a pretty impressive culture of marketing and experience marketing inside of Apple um, over the next seven years, uh, even with the, you know, with the Newton. Um, well, the, the, uh, it's always good to go to the facts. The uh, facts are that in the 10 years I was at Apple, um, we grew from 569 million to 8.3 billion, over a thousand percent. At the time I left, um, and by the way, I was pushed out. I didn't walk out the door voluntarily. Uh, when I was pushed out, we had $2 billion of cash, uh, about $200 million of debt, and uh, Apple had just passed IBM as the largest selling PC in the world. You know. But I was pushed out because there was strong concern inside of Apple that we should license the Macintosh technology, and I was adamantly against licensing the Macintosh technology. Um, because I felt every time we ran uh, models on that, we would have to have gotten the uh, uh, Mac market share up to over 20%, more like 23, 25%. Uh, if we didn't do that, we were gonna have to lay off a lot of people. It would be an entirely different kind of a, a company. And I just thought that was too big a change. So um, I was pushed out. The, the company went through two more CEOs before Steve came back uh, by the time Steve showed up in, in uh, I guess, almost four and a half years later, uh, the company was almost bankrupt. Well, and, and I, I, you and I talked about it earlier. I know you won't take credit for this, but the reality was that the, the culture of marketing that you created, together with Steve's vision, made it possible for Steve to come back into the company and create the things he did because he had a company based in experience marketing together with his product vision. And do you think that the, the change in technology of Moore law, Moore's law also helped Steve when he came back to Apple? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's, it's, it's unfair to give me all the credit of changing um, you know, Apple from a marketing standpoint. Uh, Steve and I had an amazing friendship and relationship when we did work together. And uh, we really did it together. Um, so yes, a lot of the ideas came out of experiences we had at Pepsi, but um, you know, creating that culture, you know, there was only one guy who created culture at Apple, and that was clearly Steve. My goal after Steve left was not to change the culture, but to try to figure out how to keep it going, um, because I wasn't Steve Jobs. And uh, I do th I think that it's interesting um, that even when S Steve came back, and he was a very different person uh, when he came back than when, when he left Apple, a much more mature as, and seasoned executive. But the same first principles that I watched Steve develop, um, that he really built Apple around uh, when I was there, because uh, he was you know, the, the cultural leader of the company, those principles are evident today. I mean, I can remember where he was said, you know, it's all about user experience. We're going to be the company that builds an end-to-end -end, uh, system. Uh, for us, it was desktop publishing. Later, it was uh, iPod and iTunes, and then uh, iPhone and, and App Store and iPad and App Store. Um, uh, no compromises, elegant design. I mean, all the things we recognize as Apple uh, values today are exactly the same values that, that Steve had back then. However, yeah, uh, when Steve left Apple, he went off and started Next. By the way, that technology ended up in, in Apple when he came back, but he made the same mistake he'd made back at Apple. Uh, what did he do? He com remember, he complained to me about uh, pricing the Mac too high, so he introduces Next at $10,000. And what happens? It fails. Well, going into the educational market with a $10,000 machine is pretty... It's even then, it then was even more difficult. But we have about 15 minutes left in our talk, and I really, I, I, I want people to understand that your careers didn't end when you left Apple. You know, a, a lot of people sort of lost track of you 
Um, and, and interesting, when Steve died, you sort of took on another sort of uh, uh, a renewed interest. But you've been doing incredible things uh, on your own since since leaving Apple. Um, uh, can you talk about? I know you started a, an investment uh, an investment company, and some of the things that you've been behind over the years since leaving Apple. Well. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I had never failed before, and so to be pushed out of Apple was was really you know humiliating. The press beat me up. Uh, then when Apple started to get in trouble, in those years after I left, people forgot that I wasn't CEO, and I got you know all the blame for the things that happened when I wasn't even there. And so uh, I just said, I'm on going off the radar screen. You know, I don't need to be out in the in, in the public, and I'll just do my own thing. So my brothers and I. Um, formed a family office, and we started uh, helping um, entrepreneurs build companies. And we built a lot of successful ones. We, were, we thought of ourselves as a farm team for the private equity world, and we helped build companies. Some went public. Um, you know, one here, uh, you may know in, in Florida, Metro PCS, which is a mobile wireless service company. Uh, we built Intralinks, the New York Stock Exchange company. Uh, we built Infonic you know, back in the 1990s. Um, but so we probably did, you know, 15 of these types of, of companies. But we always did it below the radar screen. Did you have a model that you uh, that you tried to replicate uh, in order to find your deals, do the deals, pick the deals you were going to do? Well, we weren't a venture capital firm. We had no interest in running other people's money. Um, so we would pick uh, domain areas, and we said domain expertise is really important. So. Uh, for a while, we were doing financial services, so we built the first credit default uh, uh, CDS exchange in London, which we sold to ICE, which is now buying uh, the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and we uh, focused on financial services, we focused on the domain of uh, mobile wireless services, and uh, more recently, we've uh, moved over into healthcare. And so I have about uh, five different healthcare companies, several of them here in South Florida. We're doing telehealth with MD Live. Um, which is up in Sunrise. We're, we're doing um, uh, a company called Watermark Medical, which uh, is uh, sleep apnea diagnostics and, and therapies. We're doing uh, a company in, uh, between Silicon Valley and, and Washington, D.C., uh, a new service called uh, Zensei, which is a consumer engagement uh, working with uh, Cigna. And um, we're doing uh, Misfit wearables, which is sensors and big data analytics. Uh, for um, doing predictive uh, uh, health uh, monitoring and things of that sort. So it's a really interesting time. Uh, Gary, what got me interested in healthcare was when Steve recruited me to Apple, it was at the early days of the microprocessor. And uh, we know that healthcare missed the personal computer, we know it missed the internet. Uh, everyone says that at $2.7 trillion, it's an unsolvable problem. Um, the more I look at it, I don't think it's unsolvable at all. Uh, it's just that uh, it's never had the opportunity for disruptive innovation on the delivery of healthcare services. Now, most of the research has gone into better medicine, which costs more money. Um, there hasn't been the same level of innovation going into healthcare uh, that we see in other industries because it's, it's such a, a complex industry from a domain expertise of regulations and, and uh, special interests. So, my uh, role in it is to look at how can consumer marketing have a big impact on the delivery of health care with patient-centric health and consumer-centric health services, uh, just as um, consumer marketing had a, a role in, in uh, high tech in the IT industry. So do you see, you see this big trend in, in disruptive opportunities. What about in the technology side? So you're seeing it in the, in the customer experience, in the consumer experience, but how do you see the technologies playing and what's gonna have to happen to the infrastructure of the way medicine is delivered today in order to accept those disruptive technologies? Well, the um, key technologies are exactly the same that we're experiencing in the rest of the economy. Um, Steve Jobs said before he died that we're in the post-PC era and that uh, personal computers and other devices are really just, you know, uh, nodes on a big cloud network. And that's exactly true. And it's uh, particularly relevant for healthcare because uh, the massive amounts of data uh, that can be processed in the cloud uh, really, really efficiently, uh, if you can get data uh, from patients and if you can um, use data 
in ways to build relationships with patients and things. You can take advantage of all of the things that we see going on in IT, first with the consumerization uh, of uh, um, the IT industry with you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Apple. Uh, well, now those same ideas can start to be moved over to healthcare. But what's different in healthcare is you've got to have HIPAA compliance. Uh, this is an industry that's highly regulated. And so sure. uh, it requires domain expertise and adapting to the regulatory issues in, in healthcare. So, for example, with Misfit Wearables, uh, we're building wearable uh, wireless sensors. Everything's going mobile wireless, as we know. Uh, and we're able to uh, link that up into the cloud and use big data analytics to predict uh, various health states for both healthy people who want to get more fit, but chronic care people who really need uh, special care. If you can measure something, you have a better chance to shift our healthcare system from a procedure reimbursement, which is what it is today, to an outcomes reimbursement. Can't have outcomes if you can't measure outcomes. Well, but that brings up a, a real uh, medical ethics question, doesn't it? I mean, what happens if one of your sensors picks up something that that is not necessarily what it was originally designed to pick up for? You know, especially when you start getting into the genetic side of 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 healthcare. Um, how are you going to weigh big data together with the medical ethics problems that will uh, are certain to arise? Well, we're just learning. Uh, you know, it's going to be baby steps along the way. The types of sensors we have today are really ones that can, um, you know, uh, measure caloric burn. They, they can um, measure, um, you know, heart monitoring. They can measure weight changes. Uh, you know, these these are uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, on the surface type sensors. Uh, I was at Caltech earlier, um, uh, la well, really last year and uh, looking at sensors that they're doing that go subsurface to the skin uh, where they can start to monitor. We have about two million proteins in a human. Uh, well, those proteins are you know, key to uh, how healthy we are. And so if you can monitor two million proteins and do it in real time on you know, you know, millions of patients, you can imagine the massive amount of data on that. Well, we're still maybe five to 10 years away from doing that. So those ethical questions haven't been figured out yet on something that sophisticated, but it's just a matter of time. So it's like everything else. We'll take baby steps with sensors on the easy stuff, and over time, you know, we'll learn how to do the more, more complicated things. Now, you give whole speeches on a topic. I want to switch gears just a little bit. Uh, what you call the commoditization of everything. And I've heard you speak about it, and, and I, I think it's an important subject that I'd, I'd like to have our, our audience get to hear a little bit about, if you can, in, in a couple of minutes, share what that concept is and, and what you see that as a trend. Well, I think the uh, biggest change that, that's going on in the global economy, we saw the uh, global economy 1.0 was all about export models, mostly export from the emerging markets into the developed West. Um, that model is being replaced by uh, the emergence of an affluent middle class uh, around the world, which is probably a billion people today, depending how you want to measure it, going to probably three billion you know, over the next you know, 15 years. And they are working with entirely different price points than anything we're accustomed to. So a smartphone that we sell for, uh, say, $800 over here, but then it gets uh, subsidized by the carriers and you get it for two or $300, over in, in the emerging markets, that sells for $800, no subsidy. And so it's completely out of balance. And so what's happening is you're seeing the, the rapid commoditization of technologies, particularly in the emerging markets, to this new middle class. And so price points are just uh, dramatically going down. And it's forcing people to do what in India they call frugal engineering, to completely rethink how you build systems uh, and to do it on uh, different approaches. It means that us back here in, in the West are starting to, to say, well, the half-life of a technology uh, is getting shorter and shorter. So one of the things about Apple, is they went from uh, introducing uh, a, a refresh on products once a year. Um, uh, one of the amazing uh, things that uh, Tim Cook has done, uh, who I think is an outstanding CEO, uh, is that he's taken that really complex supply chain uh, and he's been able to, to now do two product refreshes in a year. Well, why? Because the technology is commoditizing so rapidly that you've got to come back with a replacement product that is better 
and usually the, the previous product goes down to a, a lower price point. So for marketers, um, and some of you who are in the communications business selling minutes, um, you know how hard it is to resist when customers say, why should I pay what I paid for the minutes last year? Because everything's getting, getting cheaper. So uh, what I've learned is that uh, don't sell the features, sell the benefits. You know, describe the benefits in ways that uh, represent a complete system and a solution. Uh, then it's harder to nail down the specifics of the technology because the technology is just uh, changing too quickly to sell it any other way. Well, before we turn it over to the audience, I have one question that I want to ask um, on behalf of, let's say, all of the young uh, entrepreneurs in our audience, which is talk to yourself at the beginning of your career or at the, and, and, and what is the biggest lesson that you learned through your career, the one thing that you say is my go-to lesson when I'm gonna teach you know, my, my children or my friend's children uh, about business? Um, well, first of all, I never would've worked for a big corporation if I were uh, you know, growing up in this generation. I mean, all the fun stuff is, is uh, in the world of transformation, um, and um, that always happens in small companies. It just doesn't happen in big companies. Um, I still don't worry about big companies, even if they know what you're up to, because it'll take them two years to be able to you know, do anything that's, that's going to hurt you. But the, the thing which, which I've learned um, is that uh, entrepreneurs obviously have to have a vision. They have to be able to hire great people. They have to be able to convince people to you know, want to invest in them and join their, their uh, company. So we get all that. Um, what people don't usually pay enough attention to is, is recovery that uh, the most successful entrepreneurs have to be as good at recovery as they are at vision. Um, it really struck me uh, on this point. Uh, I was at the Masters Golf Tournament um, a few years ago, and Tiger Woods stands up at the tee. Everyone's standing around watching the great Tiger Woods do his tee shot, and he swings, hits it, and woofs it you know, off into the trees, and everyone gasps. And so we all traipse out there and watch what Tiger does for his next shot. Um, well, he's behind two trees with just a little narrow space, you know, maybe you know, less than two feet between the trees. Or he could chip it out on the green and play it safe, um, uh, chip out to the fairway and play it safe up to the green. Well, uh, golf is a game of recovery. What does Tiger do? He goes for it between the trees, you know, lands a perfect shot you know, within about five feet of the pin. And that's just a perfect example of what entrepreneurs have to do. What I've learned is that when you're out on the edge, there's a very thin line between success and failure. Uh, I can remember when Intel almost went bankrupt and IBM stepped in and put $400 million in to save it. You know, I can remember when Sun almost went bankrupt. Uh, I can remember when you know, almost every company except Microsoft yet uh, has, has uh, you know, almost gone. Is that uh, wishful thinking? No, sorry. No, I, I'll just, Microsoft's another story, but they're nowhere near going bankrupt. But uh, almost everyone has had one of those near-death experiences, and that's the real test of an entrepreneur. How do you handle yourself in that near-death experience? Because if you're going to be in a transformational moment, if you're going to be uh, out on the edge where the really exciting stuff happens, you're going to be in one of those near-death experiences at, at some point in time. And so great entrepreneurs uh, are at as good at adapting uh, to the near-death experience and succeeding and not giving up as they are in great vision, all the other things we know about. That's a great lesson. Thank you. You ready to take some questions from this audience? Sure. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, Gary, thank you very much. A round of applause for Gary and John. I just, just before we do that, I just want to announce the winner because we didn't do that They don't earlier. really want to know. No. You guys don't care, do you? So uh, this year for the first time, actually, I asked the judges to select a winner while the audience was selecting a winner. So the audience winner tonight of Startup 7 is Verbalize It. Congratulations, Ryan. And the judge's selection for the first time 
is through you. Notwithstanding, congratulations to all of you and thank you for your hard work for today. Well done, well done. All right, uh, yeah, I, questions? I, I, Go ahead. I, I just want to add a, a little observation. So, um, about a year ago, uh, I get a, an email from a, a Wharton alumni and he said, you know, I'm really interested in talking to you, you know, just want to network through the alumni. Um, and he told me a little bit about what he was doing and he seemed pretty interested, so I agreed to talk to him. And we've had lots of conversations. We actually became friends over that period of time, over a year. Um, and so it's, it's, it's uh, very exciting that, uh, to be able to tell you his name is, is uh, uh, Ryan Frankel. And he was the uh, company that you selected, Verbalize it. So congratulations to Ryan. <laughs> That Wharton Mar Mafia comes yeah, out again. Yeah, seriously. Uh, so let's open up the um, floor uh, for some questions for John. Where can we start? I, here, I have a question over here. Uh, hi, John. I, I stand up so you can see me. <laughs> uh, we once uh, met in your office in Eastman Kodak Company in Rochester, New York. You probably don't remember, and I don't blame you for it. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering, this was shortly after you left Apple, I think you joined uh, Kodak, right? And um, any reflections on Kodak at that time, and for that matter on Kodak today, uh, what's well, left? Um, uh, I did not join Kodak. Um, I, I was asked by George Fisher, who had been uh, recruited in as the CEO of um, to, to Kodak. Uh, I'd known George well when he was running Motorola, and Motorola was one of our largest uh, uh, vendor relationships when I was at Apple um, and George didn't have a marketing background he had a technical background uh, really smart guy but he asked me to come in and help him uh, think about what should Kodak become and so I came in and, and did some advisory you know work with him um, my recommendation to him was um, pretty uh, clear uh, this was at a time when Kodak had a 20 billion dollar market cap um, they were just spinning out um, Eastman chemicals uh, and uh, Kodak uh, was trying to figure out so what the future should be for their uh, photography business and I said George I said I think the future is not about picture taking it's about picture making and you want to go buy this little company called Adobe which at that time was about 1.4 billion dollars market cap and another company called Lexmark that had just gotten spun out of IBM. It was about the same size. Um, and uh, I said, if you, if you do that, uh, you can uh, create Kodak as a digital um, company uh, that has software and it has uh, the uh, printing output. Um, George actually agreed with that. Um, but you have to appreciate what it's like in Rochester, New York, where Kodak has traditionally hired the smartest people out of the best technical schools, mostly chemists, for many, many decades. And they go up to Rochester, New York, which is not the crossroads anywhere, uh, and they get hermetically sealed culturally. And that's a perfect example of one of the world's greatest brands that succeeded in one era that became hermetically sealed and couldn't make the change, couldn't culturally adapt. Um, and as we all know the end story that Kodak went bankrupt um, you know, about a year ago. Um, that could happen to other companies too. I mean, I remember when Sony was the company that Steve Jobs looked up to more than any other company in the world. You know, we used to go over and visit Akio Morita, who was the co-founder of it. And um, Sony was the apple of, of its day. And if you took away Sony's entertainment business, uh, Sony has been hemorrhaging uh, on the edge of bankruptcy for the last four or five years. Um, it, it, it lost the TV business, you know, it lost the Walkman business. Uh, it's, uh, the whole video game business is largely disappearing. Um, so the question is, I'm not suggesting Sony's going to go bankrupt, but um, Sony looks as lost today as, as, as Kodak did uh, some years ago. Uh, I, just before I go to this question here, is there a uh, Chris Spencer still in the room? Chris, come with me one second, please. 
Brenda, are you still here from Sea Beyond? I told you we had a, a raffle. Brenda, do you still or do you still have it? Okay, good. Uh, could you do me a favor and could you present this Galaxy 2 to Chris over here? Thank you very much, Sea Beyond. Mark, you had a question. Go ahead, please. I did. About uh, 15 years ago, I read an article where you said that um, architects had uh, a great educational background. They had a great worldview. Uh, what's what's the type of uh, worldview you look at now in a in an entrepreneur or somebody building a business around ideas and execution? The single most important uh, requirement, I think, is curiosity. Um, we have the access to so much information today. I mean, it's just amazing to me. But the, when I think back when I went to university, how hard it was to be able to, you know, go into the stacks of the libraries and the books you wanted were taken out by someone else. And I mean, it was just a lot of work to get very little information. There's so much information out there. Um, when I went to work at uh, Pepsi, uh, information was given to you on a need-to-know basis. You know, today, you know, information travels freely with everybody. So the really comes down to having uh, an insatiable curiosity. Uh, it's not too important what domain you pick, but you better pick one that you know really, really well because there's so many smart, talented people around. Um, so I'd say uh, insatiable curiosity and pick any domain you want because there's uh, plenty of fruit for uh, transformation. And then you want to pick an, an industry sector where the change is really going on. Because if you're there too early, uh, you can get burned. We were um, 20 years too early. I didn't realize at the time. We were 20 years too early with, with, with Newton um, when, when we came out with that. Uh, but I, I was having lunch with, with uh, Steve Wozniak today. And, and he was um, saying, he was actually speaking to an audience up in, in uh, West Palm Beach. And he was saying that the aha moment for him about where the future was, was when he got a Newton and he went to make a uh, call on it, and he d d discovered he didn't have to dial a number or anything like, like that. You know, he could just write in you know, what he wanted to do, and it automatically uh, went into the calendar, and it pulled up the phone number and would make, make the call. So he said that um, sometimes you're just too early. But almost anybody in high tech can tell you what's going to happen. We're just not very good at telling you exactly when it's going to happen and who's going to do it. Um, so I'd, I'd say curiosity, deep dive into something so you really understand it uh, at, a, at a very uh, you know, thorough level, um, and just make sure your timing is reasonably right in the sector that you pick. Question in the back there. Yeah, hi. Um, you had mentioned in the 90s that you were forced out of Apple, and I was wondering, was this a, a similar type of uh, boardroom type of situation with Michael Spindler, I think it was, that, that re, you know, superseded you? Um, with different views that caused that? I mean, or was it two different views? What exactly happened there? Um, well, it was, uh, I was ambushed. I mean, I didn't even know it. Uh, I was going to be forced out. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, there, there were different points of view. I mean, there were, um, you know, more people on, on my management team who felt we should license the um, Macintosh operating system, and they went to the board. Um, and said, you know, we think John's making the wrong decision. You know, we think we need a different leader. So you know, I don't know all the details of it, but th that was the result. Uh, by the way, it's not so unusual in the high-tech world to, to uh, see these kind of um, you know, showdown exits. I mean, just think about what's gone on in, in the last five years in, in high-tech in various companies. Um, and it seems to be more true in, in the high-tech world because <coughs> companies can change. You know, their fortunes can change so rapidly. I mean, HP was a great company, you know, when I was in the personal computer industry. Um, and yet, even though I think Meg Whitman is, is an excellent executive, I mean, she's got a, a really you know, big challenge on her, on her hands. The, the world changes so fast in high tech that it's not surprising that, that you see these kind of boardroom uh, showdowns. Wasn't that actually a Steve Jobs um, belief as well? And one, and one that you held fast to at even long after he was gone, not to license the operating system? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, the first decision Steve made when he, uh, let's give you a little background story. Uh, the thing that kept the doors open at Apple was Newton. Um, because uh, we had uh, 
helped create a microprocessor. There was no low-powered microprocessor for mobile devices uh, before Newton, so we helped form a company called ARM. Uh, and Apple owned 47% of it, and ARM was designed for the Newton. Uh, so when Apple was running out of cash, um, it took its ARM um, um, shares and sold them for $800 million. And that was crucial um, at the time that um, Steve came back, because part of that was to, to acquire Next, and part of it was just to you know, uh, maintain the costs of, of a large business like, like Apple that was hemorrhaging at that time. Um, when Steve came back, the first decision he made was he shut down the licensing of the Macintosh and went back to the proprietary technology. Now, it's not that I'm a genius on you know, technology. Uh, I just believe that what Steve was trying to do was absolutely right. Um, uh, I just felt that he was unrealistic in thinking that you could do things that, thanks to Moore's Law, just weren't powerful, uh, weren't possible enough you know, at the time that he wanted to do it. Got a question over here. Hey, John, great uh, uh, talk. Thanks for coming out and seeing us. Sure. Question for you. Um, can you comment on um, how the market values, uh, why a Amazon is, has such a, mu a much, much bigger multiple than Apple does today? Yeah. Well, I think if there, a lot of people say, well, who's the next Steve Jobs? Uh, the, the closest person to it is probably Jeff Bezos. Uh, completely different kind of a business, but I mean, he thinks on that scale that a Steve does about you know, radically changing industries. <clears throat> what Jeff is really doing is um, he's not going after you know, another high-tech company. He's going after Walmart. You know, uh, so uh, while he's uh, now starting to say, well, I think I'll agree to pay sales tax for internet sales, uh, he's only agreeing to that after he's building fulfillment centers all around the country. He'll have hundreds of these fulfillment centers you know, in locations around the country. Why? Because he wants to be able to deliver same-day service. Um, and that's going to be, you talk about cola wars or PC wars, I mean, we haven't even seen the real war yet uh, between Amazon and Walmart. So uh, Jeff likes to say, you know, show me an industry with high margins, you know, and I'll show you an opportunity. I mean, he, he loves to go in and just, uh, you know, deconstruct these businesses and turn them into low margin businesses because he knows that nobody uh, can respond to him. Bill Gates was very similar in that re regard. The reason why the, the, one of the reasons why licensing Mac technology, you know, could never succeed. Yeah, IBM tried it with OS2, a better product than than uh, um, MS-DOS and they uh, better than uh, um, Windows and they couldn't succeed um, is because Bill Gates priced the uh, um, Windows operating system at $11 a copy you know, and he made all of his money on the office software. Uh, Jeff Bezos uh, can price things way down because he makes money in other places. I mean he's got a multi-billion dollar business with AWS uh, Amazon Web Services with EC2. Um, you know, he's building just some incredible empires out there. Uh, he's just sucking up every uh, uh, marketplace. And just like uh, the, the largest uh, photo company in the United States um, was not Kodak, it was Walmart you know, with their private label brand. You know, Jeff Bezos can do the same thing uh, across industry category after industry category. So, the, I think the market appreciates that he's on a different path than anybody else, and so they're giving him a high multiple. He probably always won't have that high multiple, but um, yeah, he's getting a nice run. It will probably go on for several more years. Go ahead. Yeah, another question. Yeah. Hi, John. Where are you? As uh, a pioneering marketer, uh, what's your take on the social media and the opportunity that it offers uh, to marketers? Well. <laughs> Social media is the hardest thing for me to comment on because I'm not in my 20s. And it, it is absurd for someone um, who doesn't live and breathe it uh, to be, say that they can actually understand it. You know, uh, when you've got so many smart people uh, who are in their 20s, even younger than their 20s, who are the innovators in social media. Um, but I have enough curiosity that I really want to you know, say that I'm you know, at least involved. 
So uh, one of my favorite companies I'm involved in, uh, just launching a, a, a healthcare service called Zensei. Um, the CEO of our company uh, just turned 23. He's a, he's a, a dropout. We know that's a good good uh, credential. Uh, <laughs> so, so so he dropped out of, out of Brown University, and uh, smart as all get out. You know, very charismatic. Um, we put together an A team. You know, um, uh, I mean, it's just amazing the uh, team he has uh, you know, as, as part of his company. Um, we have Cigna as a large investor in it, um, and it's focused on social media to get social engagement uh, in the healthcare industry. Now, why is that a big opportunity? Well, we have a, an employer-based healthcare system since the end of the Second World War. Uh, there are about 95 million employees that are covered by um, health insurance, and it's not taxable. This is part of our benefits. Now with uh, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, we have two systems, the employer-based system and the entitlement system. And we have mandates that the employers have to cover everybody, and the costs are going up astronomically. So as in any change of that magnitude, you get derivative effects. And the derivative effect, and this will come back to social media, is that employers are going, are turning into self-insurers but they're putting in catastrophic insurance plans with high deductibles. And so the employers are really interested that their employees stay healthy. And the employees are suddenly waking up and saying, gee, for the first $5,000 of that high deductible, I don't have a copay. So they're becoming very conscious of what they pay. And the insurance payers, uh, who used to be in this high margin uh, business of selling uh, in, uh, insurance plans suddenly are becoming BPOs, business process outsourcers, to the self-insured employers. And they're saying, hey, I've got to get a relationship with my members. And then they go out and they run some market research and they discover that their members hate them if they even know who they are. Hence the opportunity for social media. And so what we're doing in this company, and there are a few others uh, on, the, on the same goal, uh, is to say, if you can get a relationship with the member um, where you can get them engaged in terms of their health. And if they're healthy people, stay healthy, or if they're unhealthy people, get them to stop smoking, stop you know, exercise, eat better, all of those things. Um, you can dramatically you know, uh, reduce the cost of, of, of health care. For example, Aetna uh, saved $2 billion to the bottom line, to the profit in two years by bending the, the medical loss ratio curve. That just is what I'm talking about, behavior change. So the stakes are huge if you can uh, get consumer engagement of your employees and their families, it's the women who make all the decisions in healthcare, um, as the caregiver or the person responsible for that, and, and they love social media. Now, here's a, a fact that I didn't know. Do you know who the biggest gamers are in America? It's not teenage boys, uh, it's women age 40. Uh, but they're doing social puzzles, games, and things of that sort. So social media may have a huge role in healthcare. I think I understand the healthcare side of it. I don't understand how to create this stuff because I'm not 20 years old. So I'm, I'm intrigued by it, but I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm, I'm watching a lot of really smart people figure it out, but I'm not the one who can I, give you the answer to it. I just know it's going to be important. I, Gary, I just have a couple last questions uh, before we wrap up. I have one. Over here. It's really interesting, though, John, how you take your your uh, love of learning and you dig it into businesses and CEOs that you believe in. It's a uh, it's, it's really kind of neat. Well, I look around at, at people my age, and most of them are retired and 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 regretting it because uh, they suddenly realize after five or six years uh, and they stop taking cruises and playing golf and and they suddenly are getting bored and their wife's kicking them out of the house or. Uh, and they come to me and they say, well, hey, why do you look so happy and you're having so much fun? And I said, because I still have an insatiable curiosity. I've got high energy, I, you know, and I'm actively involved. But I don't do the heavy lifting. I don't run anything. And anyone who's run a business knows that the heavy lifting is where the stress is of, of running a business. And so as a mentor, uh, I get to be another set of eyes. I work with some really wonderful people. But, um, you know, I can do it my way. Excellent. 
Mr. John, thank you so much for your wonderful interview. I have one question to you. Since you encourage entrepreneurs to be very good at vision as well as um, recovery, do you remember at any point in your career to have near-death experience? And what was your recovery? Well, thank you. Good I question. Mean, I, I've been not, not everything I've done has succeeded. I mean, I've, I've done some uh, startups that failed. Uh, fortunately, more of them have, have succeeded than failed. But um, I, I would say th that the hardest one for me was being uh, kicked out of Apple. I mean, uh, it, it was so humiliating and painful that I just crawled into a hole for, and, and didn't want to be visible at anything. Yeah. Um, and uh, it took me decades to get over that. Um, and, and, the, and the way I, I guess, rebuilt my confidence was going out and helping other people build their companies. Um, and um, so I, I didn't do it by coming back and being a, a CEO of, a, of another famous company. I did it by uh, working off the radar screen and uh, helping other people and actually helping people uh, when they were uh, in a jam, because uh, I, I started to think, I said, I wish I had had a mentor uh, that I could have looked to and asked for advice, because uh, I would have done things differently. We all look back and say we would have done things differently. But uh, having a mentor um, can be a really big deal for someone, and it's, it's a heck of a lot of fun. Was there one? Yes, do you have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, going to ask for uh, uh, something from your experience marketing background. Um, do you ever kind of Monday morning quarterback or armchair and kind of think, um, if I were CEO of the, of, for a day of one of the companies or products or services that are represented here today that, you know, I would do this or there's a, an opportunity being missed somehow from any of the kinds of service products or companies that are here in this room? Well, I don't know enough about the individual companies that are here in this room, so I can't give you that kind of answer. What, what I, I do look at companies and you know, just say, what are they doing? You know, I mean, it, 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 as you know, it's so easy to be a, 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 a critic when you're observing from the outside as opposed to being in the, in the inside. And the thing I, I did learn um, is, is that when you are in the inside, you're in a bubble. Uh, you know, people don't always tell you what they should tell you, they tell you what they think you want to hear. Um, and, you know, I mean, I look around at, at, at some companies um, and I say, you know, I'll take Microsoft. Here's, here's a company. I couldn't run Microsoft. I mean, I don't have any of the credentials to, to run a Microsoft. Steve Ballmer, if you just look at the numbers, has actually done a really good job running Microsoft. Uh, and people talk about the lost decade, and yet just look at the numbers. Forget about you know, anything else. Uh, their profits are way up. Their sales are way up. They dominate markets in, in the enterprise software world. Yet look at Microsoft uh, every time they try to do something that looks like Apple, where they try to do something with a, a consumer marketing to it. And they just are so tone deaf. It's just amazing to me. I mean, they do Zoom. They come out with a cell phone on the market for you know, a month and, and discontinue it. Uh, and now they introduce Windows 8. Uh, they advertise more than Apple. Can you remember many Microsoft campaigns? They've always been a bigger spender than Apple on advertising. Uh, they come out with, with, with Windows 8, uh, which is a pretty important uh, release for them. And what do they talk about? They talk about the keyboard, you know, uh, for the Surface. And, uh, the keyboard's interesting. You know, uh, I've gone to the demos, and it's kind of a neat product. Uh, uh, but you know, is that important to what Microsoft is? Microsoft is not a consumer brand company, so why is it wasting its time on a lot of consumer brand advertising? You know, Oracle uh, doesn't waste its time on a lot of consumer brand advertising, uh, and it's, it's got a better reputation. IBM does do advertising, but they've done a brilliant job of recovery. Uh, remember, IBM was in worse shape than HP is now uh, 20 years ago, and they did it you know, with a very careful, thought-out you know, corporate brand campaign. So I just say, how can Microsoft be as good as they are in what they've done and completely tone-deaf on anything that has to do with mobile or has to do with consumer branding? Uh, so yes, I do think about that sometimes. Before we wrap up, 
Is uh, there a Blair Pleasant still in the room? Oh, sorry about that. Blair, meet Brenda. She has something for you. Sorry. Well, a well, there, that's Thank going you. on. Thank you, see beyond. Um, I also want to thank. No, oh, just sorry, uh, and then I'm and then go ahead, please uh, wrap up. Um, I want to first of all, I want to thank you, John. It's been um, this really is an interview for me of a lifetime. Uh, as I sort of may have mentioned, I'm a huge fan and uh, not a stalker. Um, Diane, I want to thank you, uh, uh, John's lovely wife Diane, for joining us today. Um, and I got a wonderful chance to get to know her, and she's terrific. I want to thank all of you. Uh, for coming out, staying, and enjoying this interview. And of course, uh, Larry Lister, Embrace, uh, um, TMC, uh, and all the folks here at the, I, uh, at the um, IT Expo. It's been, a great, uh, it's been a great day, and it's been a great uh, program. Don't forget, tomorrow is more great stuff. And thank you all very, very much. And thank you, Gary.